Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to carry forward our series on basic sociology. Today we are going to specifically talk on Michel Foucault and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Professor Maitri Chaudhary is a renowned professor uh, and uh, through her we always get in-depth knowledge. She is from Center for Study of Social System JNU. Dear friends, let's welcome our guest Professor Maitri Chaudhary and let's try to understand understand more and more uh, about uh, Michel Foucault. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, so today, as has already been mentioned, we'll be discussing the theory of Michel Foucault. And he was born in 1926 and passed relatively early in 1984. He was born in France. Some basic facts, as you know, are always very important to make you understand the context within which the theorist grew, emerged and negotiated with. But there are a couple of other points I would like to reiterate. Uh, as many of you would be aware, I have been speaking primarily on thinkers, on theorists and the growth of uh, the discipline of uh, sociology over a period of time. And one of the key concerns which I have it reiterated from the very beginning and one which I had continued through my various lecture was that there is a fundamental distinction between social science knowledge and common sense knowledge. That is what appears to you as the truth is not necessarily the truth for everybody or truth in a more fundamental fashion. This is important as a reiteration in order to understand both Michel Foucault's concern and his continuity with earlier theorists. Many people feel that Foucault in a certain sense broke away from the tradition of the classical theorists and Marx in particular. But as we sort of go on into depth over the various kinds of his writings, you will realize that there are in certain senses great continuity as well as differences between earlier thinkers such as Karl Marx. Now, Foucault was a transdisciplinary scholar. What do we mean by a transdisciplinary scholar? That his works ranged across many disciplines, disciplines of history, sociology, psychology and philosophy. He was trained as a philosopher, but as most of you would be aware, his writings have been used for all kinds of disciplines from literature to language to analysis of texts to political science to sociology to history. And this is actually not just true of Foucault but would be also true to go back to the continuity he shares with other scholars is true of many other scholars. Weber is used by political scientists. He would be used by sociologists, social anthropologists, historians. So would Durkheim and so would Marx. And Foucault probably uh, even moved further apart because he became somebody whose writings became very central in contemporary social sciences as well as in contemporary humanities. This transdisciplinary nature is very important for you. It's important for you as young scholars or young researchers or people who are in trying to enter various kinds of jobs with skills of sociology to realize a point that I mentioned early in my early lectures that sociology is a discipline defined not by what it studies or what it does not study. It is defined by what we had at great length described as sociological perspective. That is the idea of sociological perspective is a certain way of understanding the connections that exist between various spheres of society, whether it's culture, religion, economy, polity, that how do they interconnect, what determines, what works in response, fundamental questions about the relationship between the individual and society. And sociology most importantly dealt with the study of institutions, institutions like family, kinship, marriage, polity, economy and ideas, ideas about good and bad, virtue, pure, truth, 
falsity, normalcy, deviance. So the study of ideas and institutions. Foucault has to be understood as a great scholar who was trying to understand how institutions operate in society, how ideas are constituted and how ideas change from one epoch to another epoch. He wanted to understand what was it that was changing about how we perceive the world, how we understand the world, how what is normal in one society may not be the normal in another society. Again, I would like to draw to your attention that these were issues which earlier classical thinkers very often addressed. Go back to Durkheim and he talks about the idea of the normal and the pathological, that the normal is not something is normal because I think or you think it's normal, but it is normal because it is the dominant pattern in society. Marx suggested a very similar thing when he talked about the ruling ideas of a society or the dominant ideas of a society against which the person who rebels would be considered as a deviant. It's in that tradition that Foucault continues. And I just want to talk about his major works. Uh, you will see on the screen what the major works are. And this by no means is comprehensive. Histories of Madness and Medicine. The Order of Things. From Archaeology to Genealogy. Discipline and Punish. History of Modern Sexuality. Sex in the Ancient World. So a lot of ideas about objects of inquiry like ideas of discipline and punishment, law, ideas about sexuality, ideas about madness and also the ideas about how disciplines are constructed or how we construct discourses which in turn shape life as it is. Foucault is a scholar whose language is dense. It's perhaps even denser because what we have in hand are translated works. So very often when we talk about Foucault, it seems to be extremely loaded, full of complex words. So I will go slowly and I will try to go one by one into some of his key ideas. They are not necessarily in the sequential order uh, through which Foucault was arguing, but I will sort of do a kind of to and fro as I elaborate upon these ideas. What Foucault did across his major works, and I just indicated through the slide what his major works were, was to attempt to produce an historical account of the formation of ideas, including philosophical ideas. In his work, he attempted to show how there have been shifts in our understanding from one epoch to another, which separate our thinking in the modern age from that of earlier ages. Now, if you go strictly by the words, it may seem complicated. But if you take examples, you'll probably understand. It's a very simple point, point which you young people would know, that your ideas may be very different from the ideas that I have, or your ideas may be very different from the ideas that your parents have or your grandparents have or the ideas that maybe people had in the 16th century or the 13th century, which the moment you historicize, you also do what can be understood as is destabilize. That is, you realize that ideas are constitutive of. What do we mean by ideas are constitutive of? We mean that the context, the historical context within which ideas arise should not be simply taken as a background, as a backstage. But that backdrop has a very central role in the making and shaping of ideas. For example, in modern societies, you have greater division of labor, a point which Durkheim talked about. You have greater urbanization. You have greater individuality greater role of what would be considered organic solidarity, that the relationship between parts and individual is complex. You have, in other words, greater growth of individualism. So the idea of individualism as being central in your life, the most central reference point, may seem natural to young people when they say, we need our own space. We need to do what we feel like. It's our choice. But 
If you go back to Foucault, the point would be that this idea that you have about your individuality, about your selfhood, about your subjectivity is also historically constituted. This is what Foucault meant when he said that he is trying to form, look into the making and formation of ideas and how these ideas change from one epoch to another. His concerns, he had deep interest in psychoanalysis. Uh, he himself was often uh, stressed, um, unhappy with the manner in which he felt people were disciplined in societies, uh, were constrained in societies. And he wanted to look at the world in a certain sense, like most theorists do, from a different kind of angle. In his writings on crime, the body, madness and sexuality, Foucault analyzed the emergence of modern institutions such as prisons, hospitals and schools that have played an increasing role in controlling and monitoring the social population. What did he mean by it? To understand this, we have to go back a little bit and understand that the concern of classical thinkers, as you would have already known, was with the different nature of ideas and institutions in modernity. That the modern world had a different way of organizing society, had a different approach to crime, approach to the body, approach to madness, approach to sexuality. The ideas were different. How were those ideas changing? Through what Foucault called new kinds of discourses, scientific discourses, non-scientific discourses. Discourses mean way of stating, way of speaking, way of arguing, by which we started having a different understanding, not just of society, not just of institutions, but even of ourselves. So on one hand, he's looking at ideas, and on the other hand, he's looking at institutions. So he said, just as the ideas of crimes change, the functionings and mechanisms by which the institutions of prisons operate also change. Likewise, the medical system such as hospitals, likewise the education system such as schools that have played an increasing role in controlling and monitoring the social population. Here I want to go back again to what is an exciting though perhaps at one go a little ambiguous understanding that where does Foucault stand vis-a-vis -vis the ideas of modernity and the ideas of enlightenment. If you go back to our early lectures, we saw that the classical thinkers had great hope and optimism and through of science, enlightenment and the hope that people would get rid of ideas of suspicion and would have a more enlightened approach to life, you know. Now, uh, on one hand, they had that optimism, but if you go back to my lectures on Durkheim, Marx and Weber, you will recall that along with optimism, hope, they also had recognized that there is a certain darkness, there is a dark underbelly to modernity. What, you know, we had ideas of alienation of Marx, anomie of Durkheim, the great iron cage of rationality of Weber, that there was a sense that while enlightenment brought forward great progress and development and enlightenment and in a certain sense emancipation, at the same time perhaps it also created new structures of oppression, control, discipline and surveillance. Discipline and surveillance are again two ideas of Foucault which are very central and I will be developing and returning it to it right through the lectures today. Foucault advanced important ideas about the relationship between power, ideology and discourse in relation to modern organizational systems. What do we mean by this? You are aware that whether it was Marx talking about capitalism or Weber about rationality or Durkheim about the question of social fact, power, power was a very, very central concept in all classical thinkers. Now, where, how did these classical thinkers understand power and how did Foucault understand power? 
it is extremely important to understand this point because some scholars argue that Foucault's idea of power marked a break with earlier ideas of power which assumed that power was located in either groups of people or in particular institutions whereas what Foucault was arguing that power was pervasive, it was omnipresent that I as I speak to you I am also under surveillance in some sort, I have to finish my lecture in a specified point of time, I am being disciplined so that I make sure I complete my lecture in certain times, I have rehearsed and practiced in order to produce what he would call a docile body in order to comply to the structural imperatives within which this lecture is being performed or demonstrated. I have a slightly different take that yes power as used by Foucault gave us a great deal of possibilities to understand how it is pervasive, how it is not concentrated in any one institution or state. But I would differ and say that even if you look at other thinkers they did have an idea of what would be called coercion and consent articulated by Marx developed by Gramsci later that power is not just about state power beating us up or when policemen do a lati charge or when policemen arrest you because you have done wrong or when you are punished uh, because you have offended the law. Power is coercive but power is also in, uh, works in consent that we learn to comply. We learn to behave. Remember Durkheim's lecture uh, when he said that even a child when a baby is born the baby learns to be hungry at a particular period of time. The body is being disciplined. So when you study thinkers you have to understand it as a cumulative uh, form of knowledge. Each thinker offers you new vantage points. Foucault offers you new vantage points even as he draws from earlier scholars and pushes the frontiers beyond. It is very important to understand any one scholar not as a discrete, separate, isolated unit who has many kind of topics that they write upon but as somebody who is engaging with previous scholarship, furthering scholarship and perhaps for the future when the next generation would develop these ideas even further. What does Foucault say? And the point that Foucault felt that the power is not only exercised or wielded by people or groups by ways of episodic or sovereign acts of domination or coercion. They sound big episodic or sovereign act. What it means the examples I gave you the police beat you up. The law uh, in the judicial system you are punished for an act for violating law. This does not happen all the time. It is episodic, it is sovereign that you have particular agencies or institutions acting upon you. Foucault says it is not necessarily episodic, it is not necessarily sovereign acts of domination or coercion but it is dispersed, it is pervasive, it is everywhere even as I want to please my peer and dress up in a fashion which will ask for peer approval, it is everywhere, power is everywhere and comes from everywhere. So in this sense the argument of Foucault would be that there is neither therefore an agency nor a structure, instead it is a kind of metapa or regime of truth that pervades society and which is in constant flux and negotiation. So here he would say that look it is everywhere it is pervaded. So what kind of argument would be that if it is everywhere how do you challenge it? How do you go beyond or transcend power? And here there are other interpreters of Foucault who would argue that his understanding of the subject of the human being, of the selfhood is both a product and producer of reality, a point where you can go back to Marx that we are both products and producers of society. What I can do, what I cannot do is constrained by the society, by the class, the region, the community that I belong to, by the gender that I belong to but I can also transcend and transgress and that 
that tension between the subject as oppressed and the subject as agency has to be simultaneously understood. We will go into details over this, but right now let us more and see what exactly, what more can we learn about Foucault's approach to power. A key point about Foucault's approach to power is that it transcends politics and sees power as an everyday socialized and embodied phenomena. This is why state-centric power struggles, including revolutions, do not always lead to change in the social order. For some, Foucault's concept of power is so elusive and removed from agency or structure that there seems to be little scope for practical action. But he has been hugely influential in pointing to the ways that norms can be so embedded as to be beyond our perception causing us to discipline ourselves without any willful coercion from others. I will spend a little bit on each of these words, read them over and over again to understand what he means by this. When he says that power is not just the state politics or state centric power struggle, that we know that one state, one government goes and other government comes. What he is trying to say, including revolution, that you can have a socialist revolution and you can have a socialist power, but does that transform the whole society? We have seen historically when you had the Russian revolution, many things changed, many things changed for the better, but some things were difficult to change. For one, gender relations were not easy to change because gender relations fundamentally are about our selfhood, our subjectivity. And we are not just violently coerced to follow the norms that are given to us as gendered people. We are socialized gently. We are socialized in a fashion that we do not see that power. When people say, isn't she ladylike? Or when they tell a man, isn't he macho? He is so strong. They are gentle approvals. In Foucault's understanding, these approvals would also be a manner by which we learn to be disciplined in a fashion that we start behaving in the manner in which the dominant discourse of the dominant power system of society moves or maneuvers or veers us to. He has been hugely influential that norms can be embedded in a fashion which is without us even being aware. And that is very true. And that is why I began my talk today with a reference to common sense. That is the whole sociology of common sense has taught us that we learn to be who we are in a fashion which is we do not know that we are learning. Even the first language which we learn, we learn the mother tongue in our family, the language which is spoken in the family. Are we aware that we are learning? We are not. We are subconsciously learning. What about the gestures? The gestures may be that we learn how to say no or how to say yes. Uh, maybe the way uh, a Westerner would shrug their shoulders. Maybe the way we not to say yes or not to say no are all gestures that we learn in our everyday interaction. It is embodied in our persona, the way we sit, the way we learn how to be aggressive or not be aggressive, the way we learn to show anger or not show anger, these are done in what in social anthropology would be called the minite, that is small everyday practices. So it's not just coercion, it's also consent. So the idea of power therefore in Foucault is extremely important, very central to his overall theory very central to his understanding to other terms which we will discuss in the latter part of the lecture, ideas of discipline, ideas of order, ideas of law, ideas of what he calls the panopticon, the ideas of the selfhood and the techniques of selfhood. I will stop over here, but shortly after the break we will talk about power and knowledge which is again very central to what Foucault talks about. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so very much for giving us a productive session uh, where we discussed on the theories of uh, Michael Foucault. Friends, uh, we will be back after a short break and we'll be discussing more. Till then, keep watching us. Thank you.
Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on theory of Michel Foucault and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Professor Maitri Chaudhary is a, a renowned professor. Through her, we always get in-depth knowledge on the various topics of sociology and today also we believe that you might have gathered a lot through the previous session and for this session also we have a lot for you in store. So let's welcome our guest, Professor Maitri Chaudhary once again. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Uh, as I just mentioned before the break, that we'll be talking about power and knowledge. You have got a reasonable sense, I hope, about what power is. You're also aware that for Foucault, the po question of co constraint was very important, that we are constrained from the time we are born. Very similar, I don't know others whether others would agree with it, to what Durkheim was talked about as social fact, as general, as coercive, against which if you rebel there would be sanction, that we are constrained without it being aware, aware that we are being constrained. How do we get constrained? How do we learn to be constrained? And it is done, as I mentioned earlier, through ideas that people have. What are these ideas? And he said these ideas are the accepted forms of knowledge. They could be scientific understandings, particularly in the West, after the Enlightenment when you have the growth of science, the growth of a particular forms of medical knowledge, legal knowledge, scientific knowledge, knowledge of what is right, what is wrong. You had, he would remember, he was speaking in that context, that the truth was supposed to be that which was understood as a scientific understanding of truth. At a larger level, uh, particularly for sociologists who deal with the everyday life, common sense, truth is something which is not truth in a revealed sense of the world. Not in the sense when we talk about truth in religion or truth in metaphysics or philosophy. But truth, he would say, is produced by virtue of multiple forms of constraint. It induces regular effects of power. What is truth is considered truth because people believe that is the truth. This is what Foucault calls the regime of truth. Each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth, that is the types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as truths. Uh, those mechanisms which distinguish true and false statement, the techniques and procedures according value in the acquisition of truth, the status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true, very, very similar to what would um, the German ideology Marx argues about ruling ideas being the ideas of the ruling section. Here what happens is that who decides what is true? The people in power decides what is true. They not only decide what is true, they decide what is normal, what is abnormal, what is pathological, what is deviant. These general politics of truth then get implemented and reproduced by institutions. Foucault gives a lot of attention to techniques and procedures by which truth is established. To understand the linkage between power and knowledge, the idea or the concept of discourse in Foucault becomes extremely important. Discourse refers to ways of constituting knowledge together with the social practices, forms of subjectivity and power relations which constitute it. Simply put, discourses are more than ways of thinking and producing meaning. They tell us what seems to be natural in a given point of time. I'll give you a couple of examples. I've given the example here that in the 19th century with the women's movement, their demand was for equal wages, the right to vote. But they did not demand equal distribution of child care. Because at that point of time, in 19th century, the right to vote was important. That was the normal. That defined the boundaries of the women's movement. Child care became a central demand later. So what we think we can argue or say in a society is decided by the dominant discourses or ways of saying, ways of arguing, uh, explicit in the media, academia, political discourses, which limit the way we can think. They give us certain kind of boundaries. We are not able to think beyond that. It is like at one point of time in a traditional Indian society, if a woman said that she's going to travel alone, 
because she wants to see the world, people would think she's lost her mind. Because that desire could not be articulated within a dominant discourse which said, look, women have to get married very fast. She will be insecure outside a marriage. So the discourses, that is the way of thinking, the ideas, the way of expressing, decide and constrain. They therefore lead to what would be called the disciplining of the self. Discourses are also linked to another concept in Foucault, governmentality. Governmentality. Discourses and other practices in power regulation, such as practices of government and the government of the self, shape the subjectivity of the people. In Foucauldian terms, they shape the individual's relations to her, himself, and thus affect the mobilizational potential of social movements. They sound big words. What do they mean? And you may ask, how does the government shape me? How does the government manage to impose or impinge upon who I am or who you are? The process is complex. A very simple example, the textbooks that we study in all our schools, the syllabus through which we learn our history, our geography, our culture, our past, the world outside, the globe, are all decided and disciplined in a certain sense by the structures of power. They in turn teach us about what is right and wrong, what it is to be successful, what it is not to be successful. You will remember in my discussions on uh, the critical theorists, uh, you know, when we're talking about Marcuse or Adorno, uh, I had said that in the consumer society, advertisements could be a form of discourse. Advertisements could tell you the fashion industry through the discourse of advertisements, through the ideas that they propagate would tell us what, that we should be conscious about how we look. Our obsession with our body, our appearances become very much part of a society where publicity or presentation of the self becomes extremely important. People now, advertisements tell us what kind of kitchens we should have, how we should entertain our people, what kind of weddings we should organize for our children, what kind of wedding cards which we should design. These are the everyday discourses which are manufactured and reproduced in society. On one hand, the power comes from the state, but like Foucault says, there are other alternate sites of power and we learn to shape ourselves in that fashion. So he goes on to argue that in many governments, particularly in neoliberal governments, the likelihood of social critique and protest is seriously hampered by what some call the subjectification process. I would like to very briefly explain what we mean by a neoliberal government. It's important for all of us to know what neoliberalism is because it's the dominant form across the globe today is a form of government where you have an understanding that the market is the most fair and equitable instrument to give distributive justice to everybody, that it's, it, it creates fair play, that it will reward the most efficient, it will reward the very best. The market logic is then applied in all spheres of life, education, that education should be profit, it, should, it applies for medicine, that medical hospitals should be for profit, it applies to individuals, that we have to be successful, we have to sell ourselves, literally in the sense that it's not good enough that I lecture you, I should be able to promote myself, I must create a brand. So the discourse of neoliberalism is a very different discourse from a type of what would people call social welfare government, where the discourse would be rights, rights of individual, that the state has a, has a commitment to look after the poor and the disadvantaged. The state is committed to that, whereas in a neoliberal, the market discourse takes over. And in this, what becomes the subjectivity, that the selfhood, you and me, start believing in these principles as our defining principles. So when people say, I am so successful, they are going to say that I am so successful because I am so smart or I am so good. They are not going to say I am so successful because I have been very lucky to have been born in a privileged family where I have been given the best education. 
cultural capital, what Bourdieu calls a cultural capital, linguistic skills, ability to perform, that there is a social capital behind my individual performance. But a new, in a neoliberal governmentality, the subject, that is each of us, the self, starts believing that the self is the propelling instrument of everything. What we achieve is because we deserved it, or we defined it, or we strived for it. So a lot of people have sort of argued that it leads to the retreat of a more collective vision and celebrates the idea of selfhood. I am no expert on the selfie, but perhaps the technique of taking a selfie capitalizes or demonstrates exactly the obsession of, you know, capturing yourself. You see yourself as an isolated individual acquiring, succeeding. The trauma of such a disciplined self or subjectivity is obvious because there is great deal of tension. If you believe that you alone are responsible for everything that has happened to you, then the chances of you being deeply uh, you know, tense, anxious, nervous also get compounded. So the techniques of the self is another concept which Foucault introduces. Foucault's approach to sub subjectivity is linked to the study of techniques of the self. And this idea of the technique is something which he uses very often in his text Discipline and Punish. This concept is applied to the self that is what we do to ourselves rather than to others. What do we mean by the techniques of the self? Uh, at a very elementary level, at a more obvious level with you young people would be very familiar, we see a culture when people literally decide to sculpt their body. They decide to have a longer nose than they have, they, have, they want to have very tiny waist, they want to have an hourglass figure, they want to have a zero size figure, they want to be fair and lovely or fair and handsome. And you have objects in which you literally use these techniques to produce a certain self. You're taught how to speak, you're taught how to work, and you have a certain kind of subjectivity. When you do that, you don't say that, look, I am being coerced or being forced, or there is power which is forcing me to behave like this. You say, it is my choice. Because the dominant discourse, to go back to Foucault's concept of discourse, is that choice is a dominant core choice that we are free willed individuals we do what we wish to uh, there is no power the power and the coercion becomes invisible it is rendered out of vision we become in that sense captives of the discourse that we are inbuilt but here is the tricky part are we complete victims and captives or do we have the ability to question and go beyond that a serious reading of Foucault would suggest there is possibility of critique. In fact, the fact that Foucault unearths what goes into the makings of crime or the makings of the criminal order or punishment or law or the medical system suggests that the critique itself is a way of unraveling the construction of discourses. I want to bring in another concept of Foucault here, the panopticon. And if you look at the visual, here is a visual of the panopticon. Uh, look at the visual of the panopticon and you will understand if you go to any hospital, any school, and any place, public place, a mall, you will find that very often you have what would be called the panopticon. That is, you look at the visual of the panopticon. And by this panopticon, the idea is that there is constant observation. You have constant observation you can be at a, nowadays of course we have uh, you know um, various kinds of uh, technology which would be constantly monitoring what we are doing uh, but at other points also when you didn't have that technology you could have a guard who st stands in a corner you can't see but he can see who is doing what even before we had a CC television or anything like that so the panopticon is that you do not know who is observing you, but yet this structure of discipline makes you realize, makes you a little conscious that perhaps you are being observed. 
constant observation acted as a control mechanism, a consciousness of constant surveillance. So the idea of coercion, constant surveillance, constant observation is very central to the idea of the panopticon. So the argument would be that look at all these modern institutions, look at a hospital, look at a school, look at an asylum, look at a factory, look at a prison, everywhere it is built in a fashion that you constantly can monitor and constantly can make out who is doing what. Here, if you remember when we began, we said that Foucault discusses ideas and discourses and how these ideas and discourses change over a period of time. And he argues through the example of punishment when you have a crime and you are punished, he says at an earlier period in a pre-modern world which was not so scientific, what did you do with a person who had to be punished? Somebody does something very wrong. So you may have people pelting stones at that person as punishment. You may have uh, people you know, shaving somebody's head like we see in our old folk tales and putting them on a donkey and making them work. That is a public humiliation of the victim or the criminal, not the victim, of the criminal is an important part of the techniques of punishment in a traditional society. In a modern society, his argument would be that it becomes invisible. You don't know, really know who, how this process is. When you are killed, in our country, unfortunately, we still do have capital punishment. We, we know that somebody at such and such a point of time will have, but he is then uh, examined by the doctor. You have certain kind of techniques, procedural, which says, and then he is declared fit to be hanged. That is not done in public eye, it is done behind and he says the discourse of punishment, order, law, criminality changes. Likewise, in earlier times when people fell ill, you were left, you stayed at home and everybody around you were there and they saw you suffering or slowly, you know, maybe breathing your uh, last. But today what happens is there is anonymity, you fall ill, you are rushed into an ICU, you rushed into a medical system, you really don't know what that technique of medical system is, you become a certain object with these new techniques, missionary, you know, uh, mechanisms. So everybody even common sense will say now you are in ICU, now you are going through an MRI, now you are being scanned, now you are in ventilator, here everything is being done outside the everyday vision. So whether it's hospitals, whether it is schools, it is outside. As a critique of these modern institutions, you had therefore experimentation of having schools which were free. Think back of Shantiniketan where Tagore started his system of open school was that he was uncomfortable with the idea of schools as disciplining mechanisms and he wanted a certain kind of learning which was in tandem with nature in tandem with everyday lives, with tandem with everyday people. It should not be that children should be then blocked into a school. They do not interact with ordinary people, everyday people. What you learn there becomes invisible to the larger world. So this has been a debate everywhere that should hospitals, schools, asylums and factories operate in a more sophisticated disciplined fashion where you feel you are not being disciplined unlike putting prisoners in dungeons that were used in centuries ago in monarchical states around the world. It is a complex term, but uh, very often theories are not just theories which you take a lump sum as a whole, but theories are illuminating devices. It starts making you think that is this a way, can Foucault be used productively to understand schools? to understand asylums, to understand hospitals, to understand factories, to understand madness. Because in earlier times, even asylums, you put away the mad person. Whereas in traditional societies, the person who probably would be considered as somebody who is not quite there would be part of everyday life. You did not shun them off behind walls where the ordinary people could then live their ordinary happy lives and not see what was happening to those who were, you know, condemned to be declared mad. 
So he was very, very uh, attentive to the study of madness. Likewise, his interest into the study of sexuality, that what we consider as sexually normal or sexually abnormal is constructed through discourses, ways of writing, making of statements, scientific discourses, other forms of discourses which render certain kind of sexual practices as normal and others as abnormal or as deviant, very often punishable by law. And you're very familiar as young people, the debate on homosexuality. So the idea that these are socially constructed, not something which is naturally given, which give, takes us back to the core issue of classical thinkers in social sciences, that you do not accept anything as taken for granted. You have to question them. I want to then, we've talked about power, we've talked about uh, governmentality, we've talked about the panopticon, we've talked about the discipline. I want to do a little more about what he meant by discipline. Foucault suggests this individuality can be implemented in systems. I'll perhaps before I read it out about what he meant by discipline, and this is a quote of his, perhaps you have to understand that he was comparing between the modern and the pre-modern societies. You have to go back to the point I made that whereas most scholars felt that the enlightenment was something which would be revealing, which would make people feel free, which will render people free from the clutches of power and control, you know, he had a little more different take on the discipline which is used in what he calls officially egalitarian societies. And officially we are in an egalitarian society, meaning we assume that all of us are equal here. Uh, the idea of equality, liberty and fraternity are very central in liberal democratic societies. Yet he says that we see discipline operating in a fashion which makes us what we are which actually do not allow us to be free. We know constitutionally we are free, but these small techniques of controlling and coercion make us behave in a fashion which is conducive to the dominant discourses because if you behave in a fashion which is in violation of that, you will be punished. Small techniques, things which are debated and are very often contested even in contemporary society. How do you dress? What is proper dressing? What is vulgar dressing? What is seductive dressing? What, how should girls dress? How should men dress? How should women dress? Dressing, which seems to be such an ordinary and everyday fashion, is also subject to certain kind of discipline, despite us living in an officially egalitarian discipline. So his argument is that discipline is used to construct non-egalitarian power relation in an egalitarian society. So people could have a problem, say, with uniforms. Then why are people asked to be in uniforms and dress up similarly? Are you not being disciplined in a particular fashion? Others can disagree and say that this allows people all to wear similar kinds of clothes. It can be seen in both ways. But the point with discipline is to draw attention to the fact that discipline is not something when somebody comes and beats you up, which is violent exercise of power. But discipline can also take place in far more insidious, everyday techniques of what he would call the making of the self techniques of creating subjectivities. I'll quote here from Foucault himself and then perhaps we can spend a little bit of time by what he means by it. Historically, the process by which the bourgeoisie became in the course of the 18th century, the politically dominant class was masked by the establishment of an explicit coded and formally egalitarian juridical framework made possible by the organization of a parliamentary representative regime. But the development and generalization of disciplinary mechanisms constituted the other dark side of these processes. 
the general juridical form that guaranteed a system of rights that were egalitarian in principle was supported by this tiny everyday physical mechanism by all those systems of micro power that are essentially non egalitarian and asymmetrical that we call the discipline. This is a loaded, loaded phrase. I would really appreciate if each of you go back and read what he means by the discipline and in which fashion he shows the contestation or the conflict between the formal egalitarian or equal structure, the freedom that which we have living in a democratic society and the unfreedom which is exercised by what he calls might power, the disciplining mechanisms that I have to sit in a particular fashion here. I cannot lounge and speak to you, right? These are the micro power. There's a particular language control. What words are considered good words, bad words, swear words? What words should I use? What kind of clothes should I use? What kind of examples should I give? Am I not self-censoring myself? I want to give an example and I feel maybe if I give you an example of that order, it will be provocative. Maybe it will be controversial. So there is a self-disciplining constantly taking place. There is an observation. There is a panopticon which is in action even as I am an agent and I am free to speak to you in this fashion. Before I finish, I just want to tell you that all of you must look at this amazing possibility of Foucault where Foucault is telling us of how we as individuals and as collectivities are constructed by power and that power is in a certain sense reproduced through discourses and we are at the same time subjects of that discourse, products of that discourse, but yes, we have the ability to critique like Foucault critiques his discourses to show what the dark side does in order to enable another world where the freedom is perhaps even greater than the freedom that we have today. Thank you. Thank you so very much, dear friends. Today we had a very vivacious session. We believe that you might have gathered maximum of knowledge and uh, if you uh, want to explore the lecture once again and the number of times you want it, then we would like to share that this lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. Keep watching us. Keep writing us it at info.cc at nic.in. Your feedbacks as well as your questions are most welcome. We are going to meet soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you once again. Much.